Welcome back. Before telling you more about the Heliopolitan cosmogony, please consider the difference between, for instance, the biblical and Quranic concept of creation. There, we are looking at a single God who has always existed and always will, and who created everything out of strictly nothing. So, besides God himself, nothing existed before the creation of the world. By contrast, in ancient Egypt, in the Heliopolitan view, we have seen that there is something else that already existed before the primeval god Atum. Now, we will examine the next stages of this creation process. In the first stage of the creation process, Atum created the first gods, Shu and Tefnut, exclusively, exclusively through his hound salmon, or according to another story, through his saliva. So there is no mother involved here at all. The son of Atum, Shu, is the god of the air. His name means emptiness. He personifies the space that separates the earth from the sky. Atum's daughter is Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. And since she is the daughter of Atum, it follows that she is Shu's sister. But she was also married to Shu, so that we can describe her as his sister wife. She represents the atmosphere of the lower world just as Shu represents the atmosphere of the upper world. In the second stage of the creation process, Shu and Tefnut were also blessed with a son and a daughter. The son, Geb, is the god that personifies the earth. It is usually depicted anthropomorphically, that is to say in the form of a human being, and sometimes with a white-fronted goose a creature that the Egyptians in this period associated with the creation. His sister, called Nut, was the goddess that personified the vault of the heavens. And once again, she was married to her hound brother, Geb. She represents the firmament and she is the mother of the celestial bodies. To sum up, these first two stages concern the cosmic elements or the physical elements which make up the universe in which we can live. For example, the air, the earth, the sky. As you can see in this next figure, Geb, the god of the earth, reclines beneath his sister wife Nut, the sky, from whom he is separated by their father Shu, the god of the air. In the same way that the first two stages concern the cosmos, the third and last stage of the creation process concerns the world of the living, and more specifically, the children of Geb and Nut, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. As we will see, these gods provide a link between the physical creation and the social order. But firstly, let me tell you the story of the mythical cycle of Osiris. This story is no doubt the most extensive text of its kind in ancient Egyptian culture, and it was not found in any ancient Egyptian text that has survived, but it was preserved by the Greek author Plutarch. In the first part of this story, the well-known god Osiris ruled Egypt as a king, but his brother, the god Set, was jealous of him. Set plotted against Osiris and murdered him, dismembered his body and scattered all his parts. Osiris had a sister wife, the well-known goddess Isis, and Set also had a sister wife, the goddess Nephthys. You should be comfortable with this concept by now. In part two of the story, Isis tried to find the body of his husband Osiris, after their brother Seth had killed him. And Nephthys, their sister, assisted Isis. This is quite remarkable because Nephthys was the wife of Seth. After some time, Isis managed to rebuild the body of Osiris and resurrect him, but only for a while. 
In this short space of time, however, Isis did get pregnant and conceived the god Horus. In the third part of the story, Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, avenged his father's death by defeating Set. Finally, Horus came to rule Egypt as king and has the and has the rightful heir to Osiris. According to what we learn with the mythical cycle of Osiris, let's examine the links between these gods, the physical creation and the social order. Osiris was the god of death and resurrection, the god of the netherworld, but also the god of fertility. Horus was the incarnation in the world of the living of the king, for or the pharaoh and is called in ancient Egypt. And thus, the main role of Isis came to be that of the king's mother. Maybe that's why she is associated with the hieroglyph of the royal throne. By extension, Isis became the mother of all. So far, we have only met Set with his hostile behavior as the god of violence, chaos and confusion. But he was not entirely negative. He was also the god of strength, tuning and protective power. As we have seen in the mythical cycle of Osiris, Nephthys helped her sister Isis against her own brother and husband Set by rebuilding Osiris' body. Thus, it makes perfect sense that the ancient Egyptians believed that these two sister goddesses grant protection to the deceased. Now, it's time to sum up the Heliopolitan cosmogony and theogony. In the beginning, there was Nun, the primeval water. Stimulated by the energy of Nun, Atum became aware of his own existence and became the creator god the creator of the world, or to use a technical term, the demiurge. Out of his own substance, using both his masculine and feminine functionalities, Atum produced the first couple of deities, Shu, the god of the air, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. With the children of Shu and Tefnut, Geb the earth and Nut the sky, all the cosmic elements were now in place. The last generation, the children of Geb and Nut, who are Osiris, Isis, Set and Nephthys, symbolized the living world and its social order. And finally, at this Heliopolitan Enead, we can add Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, and Anubis, the son of Osiris and Nephthys. I hope you are convinced by now that the complexity of all these gods and myths does not prevent these ancient Egyptians' belief from being very interesting. And let me conclude by drawing your attention once again to how the conflict between the gods Osiris and Set relate to the physical geography of the land of Egypt. On the one hand, Osiris, who stands for wise sovereignty and rules the fertile land, was opposed to Set, the personification of brutal force which reigns over the desert areas. On the other hand, and even today, the land of Egypt offers a strong contrast opposing the fertile land of the Nile Delta and the Nile Valley, which is seen as familiar, organized and manageable, and the arid land of the deserts perceived as hostile and chaotic. The Mesopotamian and the Coptic worlds can show similar concepts. <laughs>